All right, what are we talking about? We're talking about demons, angels and demons. Or as the word of God uses them when it uses them 77 times in the New Testament, devilish spirits or uh, spirits, devils, little devils. Okay, so last week when we kind of veered into talking about demons, I kind of went into a few um, areas talking, kind of building a foundation, talking about the pre-Adamic world and things of that nature and things that you would probably not regularly um, hear or listen to in a, in a Bible study. And, but, but, but I think it's important for us to, to go through that. Um, I kind of want to move the focus a little bit. We're still talking about demons and evil spirits and devils, but what I've been trying to do is build a history of them, a foundation of them. How, how, did, they, how did these things, these beings come about? What, what has their history been? What have they done in the time that they have been created or existed? Uh, what, what does the Bible have to say? And what can we kind of link together and put together about what these beings are? Now, most people, most Christians, and even non-Christians, if they kind of at least know about the biblical um, history, will probably be able to tell you about, uh, in kind of a snapshot, uh, what the devil is and what the demons are. Most people can probably tell you that the Bible, the biblical account of the devil is that he was cast down from, um, from heaven, right? He was once a good angel, and he was, most people can tell you that. Um, but what we want to do is go beyond that. I think of that as more of a facade. So I want to go deeper. I want, I want us to dig deeper in what the Word of God has to say about it. And it's not an easy topic to connect the lines in because there's a lot of crisscrossing from Genesis to Revelation. But we're going to try to do a lot of that tonight and in the following nights um, after this because only God knows how long this is going to take. Probably a long, long time. But strap your seatbelts and let's, let's get in for the ride. So last week we, we, we talked about kind of the pre-Adamic world and I tried to build a picture as to why um, there were events that happened before the fall of man. Um, there are many Bible scholars that like to think that um, the events which involve Satan falling down and being cast down from heaven kind of probably happened in that Genesis 1 to uh, chapter 3. And I, I, I gave you some reasons as to why that cannot be, at least if we follow the biblical account, and why that had to have happened before the creation of man, before the creation of Adam, before the creation of the heavens and the earth. Um, I talked about how in Genesis chapter 1, we don't see God say, in the beginning God created the he heaven and the earth. It says the heavens. And there is a reason for the word the heavens there. I kind of pointed out to you guys um, differences in scripture of when the word heaven is used. Specifically talking about the inhabitation where God dwells in Psalms, in Isaiah, in Ezekiel. Um, and heavens in general, meaning different spheres of the heavens. Talked about how the words, sometimes we try to read and we just jump through. Like principalities and powers, how they're not, re they're not referring to physical governmental uh, uh, um, systems, but they're referring to spiritual hierarchies, spiritual uh, uh, stratifications of governments. Um, most of it in 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 the in the devilish realm, in the demonic world, but also some of it in the divine realm, because that's where everything began. And then after everything was divine, then the devil decided to corrupt that system, fell, and the Bible says he fell with his angels, and the angels he fell with are what we know today to be the demons, the devils. Like I said, the word demon, it's not found anywhere in scripture. The words used for demons in the Bible as it is, is devils. But it's the same thing, right? Just, just, just trying to get you to understand. So when the word is devils or evil spirits is used in the Bible, what does it mean to be devil? Why, why devils? Because it's, they're basically smaller versions of the devil they're basically his angels they're basically his his companions right the people the other wicked evil sinful angels who try to help the devil accomplish his mission on the earth now we know that the devil will not accomplish his mission but he has never stopped trying to derail god's plan at this moment, he is still trying to derail God's plan, and he will always try to derail God's plans till he gets bound up for the final time. 
He's going to get bound up once, get released, and then be bound for the final time after his final judgment. We'll get to that. Now, there's a lot to get into. It's a lot to get into. So let's start. Not tonight, because I know we're not going to get there, but possibly next week or in two weeks from now, we're going to talk about the five levels of the underworld that the Bible talks about. All right? So this, the Bible does not just talk about hell as the only underworld. There is Gehenna, there is, there is Tartus, there is uh, um, Hades, there is Sheol. We'll get into that. The Greek and the Hebrew break that down for next week. So the demons or the little devils as we know them there is a large portion millions of them are locked in to a certain level of hell there are certain that have been released and are being released by the actions of human beings we'll find that out we'll eventually get to talking about what jesus has to teach about demons because actually jesus uh teaches us about 70 to 80 percent of what we know about the spirit world the devils and the demons when he casts them out his interactions with them um there is so much for us to learn amen so should we shall we get started tonight let's get started okay genesis chapter 6 genesis chapter 6 i kind of previewed for you guys um a couple of weeks ago about the book of Enoch, um, why it's not in the Bible. I didn't go too deep into it, but, you know, there are reasons why it's not in the Bible. But it is quoted or referenced in the Bible twice. And I would even say, if I was to push it a little further, uh, three times, because I think Peter sort of referenced it. Um, and, and there's so much more in that book uh, that's not in the Bible that people talk about. And I use it for, as a reference thing, not to base the authority of my argument off, uh, because this is the only thing you should ever base any argument you have. That's, that's the only thing that's true, tried, and sure. Amen. Other things can help you, but if they're not scripture, I'm not going to bank my life on it. The Bible does reference other books that we don't have that are possibly out there uh, if you read through kings and chronicles the bible references books i was telling my wife on our on our drive here to church the bible references books like the book of jasher um the 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 the, the bible references books like you know the book of the chronicles of judah that's not necessarily and 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 israel there are other books the bible have you ever read through numbers chronicles kings and at the end of a chapter it says something like our is the story of Soso King not recorded in the Chronicles of... Exactly. Okay, so there are, there are those Chronicles that are referenced in the Bible. that are not necessarily in the Bible. Okay, so I'm, I'm just trying to give you a picture of that. So those books could be true. Um, and there's a lot of history to watch it. Amen. But let's talk about demons. Let's talk about these little devils that the devil uses... To try to carry out his plan on the earth. Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6, we see a very weird, strange story that the Bible does not do. After that, there's not much um, except in 2 Peter and Jude. Uh, it, it seems to be a, a, just a theme there and it kind of disappears for a little bit. And it's something that has puzzled um, the minds of, you know, curious scholars over time. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Verse 1. Now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God, note that word, saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. All right. If you're married and you've got your wife next to you, turn to her and say, you are beautiful. You are beautiful, sweetie. Okay, there you go. I guess there's only two people who qualify. Ha! Ah. <laughs> Your spouse might be at home. <laughs> All right, the daughters of men were beautiful. Man, I thank God my daughter is beautiful. And they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Is there many people who live more than 120? Yeah, no. That's, there's a reason why right there. There were giants on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. All right. Sons of God 
saw the daughters of men were beautiful and decided to go sleep with them and in so doing produced giants who we know as the Nephilim. Now you say, why is the word Nephilim not there? There's a reason. I brought the Israel Bible, all right? This is the Tanakh, the Jewish Bible, one of my study Bibles. Uh, first thing you have to know about the Tanakh, the reason why it has an odd way it is, is because Hebrew is not read from left to right. It's read, it's read from right to left. So it's got an odd, but don't be dismayed. You just remember it's read from right to left and not left to right. So instead of opening like this, you open from the back. Okay, now in the Tanakh, as compared to what we've got, which, which is translated from the Hebrew to the Greek, the Tanakh, which is the original Hebrew statements, actually uses the word, the divine sons of God. The divine sons of God. Who are these sons of God? Because these sons of God, if we come to understand who these sons of God are, we can understand how the spirit world works. Who are these, son of, these sons of God? Now, most Protestant biblical scholars say the sons of God are man, regular man that did not come from the line of Cain, but were, came from the line of Seth. They're wrong. And I'll give you many reasons why they're wrong. I disagree with them. I've read the commentaries. I've read stuff. But they are wrong. One of the reasons they're wrong is because they reference a scripture in Matthew chapter 22 where it says, Jesus says that in heaven we will not marry as the angels in heaven do not marry. And so they use that as the line say because Jesus said the angels do not marry in heaven. So that means angels could never marry. So that scripture cannot mean spirit beings. They have to refer to Normal human beings, sons of God. Now, the problem with that assumption is they read too fast the line where Jesus says, you will not, be, you will not marry or be given into marriage like the angels in heaven marry, do not marry. This is why they go into it. That's true. Jesus was correct. The angels in heaven do not marry. However, these guys we've read about were fallen angels. And their sin was that they left the place of their habitation, in so doing, defied God, saw the daughters of men, that the daughters of men were beautiful, and came down and says, we want to sleep with the daughters of men. Number two, that's one big reason. And you'll see, I'll show you this in Peter. These were not normal human beings. You say, why? Well, we see so many other instances where we know that the word sons of God were used. In Job, in Peace, Second Peter, in Jude. And in all those instances, they do not refer to human beings. So for these supposed scholars to be true, they have to literally say, this is the only verse in the Bible where sons of God is used, and it refers to regular human beings. Forgetting the tens of scripture where sons of God refers to angels. Because they want to refer to Matthew 22. But they're referring to a false understanding and interpretation of Matthew chapter 22. So, these sons of God, who were these sons of God? Who were these sons of God? And what did they do? Why, how did it come about? Number two, a man sleeping with a woman a billion times will not cause them to produce a giant. Because God said he created them after their kind. Now let us make man in our own image, and our own likeness. For there to have been giants that God hated, it meant that it was a disruption of God's divine plan. So it was not holy, righteous men who are sons of God going to go sleep with women producing giants because that's not in God's order. It's not seen in Genesis chapter 1. It's not seen as how God says, I will make man and woman, and they will produce a seed. Their seed will be man. Okay, you're not sleeping with somebody and producing something different from what God originally designed in the DNA of man. So these Bible scholars, I'm sorry to say, are wrong. Record it, clip it, and save it. They're wrong. 
Now you may say, what was the purpose of Satan in creating giants? Why did he want to create giants? Well, who can help me? All right. They wanted to destroy Genesis chapter 3. A war is being waged. God declares a curse on the woman and on the serpent. He says, your seed, speaking to the woman, shall smite the head of the serpent, will destroy the serpent, but the seed of the serpent will deal with the heel of the woman. The devil, ever since he was cast down from heaven, has sought to stop God's divine plan. I want you to understand that. He is always seeking to stop God's divine plan. It's his business eternal mission to stop God's divine plan. So he figured, if I am able to corrupt, 2 Peter uses the word corrupt, Jude uses the word corrupt, if I am able to corrupt what I call the Adamite stock, the Adamite normal man DNA, I am going to be able to obstruct God from sending someone through the seed of the woman who will become Christ the Messiah, who will then be able to save people from their sins. So I'm going to corrupt the human race. I'm going to make God mad. And because here's the thing, God honors his word. When his word goes for it, it does not come back to him void. His word is yes and amen. When God speaks a thing, even he will not go back on his word. So the devil was like, okay, I'm, I'm going to box God in. It's like playing a game of chess. I'm going to checkmate God. Check God. How? I'm going to have my angels go sleep with women on the earth, produce giants, have the giants feel the earth, corrupt the earth. So in so doing, somewhere down the line, I corrupt the human race. And so the seed of the woman... Is not in a place to save humanity. Problem is, the devil is too slow. He ain't fast enough. He's not fast enough. And the reason why we know that is because there are saved, born again, spirit filled believers looking at me right now. Saved by the blood of Jesus. He could not stop. The devil thought, again, sometime thousands of years in the future, and if he could get. The Romans and the Jews ganging up together to kill this Jesus. Oh, I'm going to stop him from being able to save these people from their sins. He did not realize that in Jesus dying, he was actually fulfilling God's plan of saving humanity. I cry. You maybe cry when you watch the movies like The Passion. But guess what? Yeah, I feel emotional in that moment. But man, be so thankful that Jesus paid the price for you. Because we would have no hope if there was no Jesus. The devil's plan has always been to disrupt God's plan. Time and time and time and time again, he's wanted to disrupt God's plan. But we know that if we know God, the enemy cannot Disrupt God's plan for our lives. It can only disrupt the plan of God for people who do not surrender themselves to the Lord. We don't, that's, 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 that's how he's going. So he, he's been trying. He went to the, the desert. 40 days, Jesus was there. He was trying us. He's like, okay, I couldn't stop him from being born. So I'm going to stop him by actually using him to stop salvation you know how the devil will come try to deceive you to actually destroy god's purpose for your life sometimes we are our own worst enemies right that's what the devil was trying to do he was trying to flip the script it's like okay i couldn't stop i couldn't stop the 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 the, the, uh, the, the pure adamite stock from from producing the seed of the woman i, I, I couldn't pro I, I tried many things i tried to have the children of israel rebel and rebel and rebel and rebel god sent them into captivity they came back out of captivity were still hard-hearted i mean i've tried okay he's been born oh here he is i tried to kill him when he was born by herod right Herod sending out people said, go kill everybody who was born in this time that's his son. Oh, I couldn't stop him then. Oh, but he's grown now. I'm going to try to stop him by actually using him and promising him all the treasures of this world, which I am the God of. Did that work? No. It's like, all right, I'm going to try to stop him by killing him using the Jews. Did that stop God's plan? 
No, we didn't. So now he knows he can't stop Jesus. He's resorted, he's resorted to stopping us individually. Because that's all he can do. All right. Now, how do I prove these theologians wrong? Number one, the expression of sons of God is found only five times in the Old Testament. And every time it is used of angels. Okay, we've read the first one, Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 to 4. Job chapter 1, verse 6. All right, you don't need to go there. What's the story? Someone tell me. In Job chapter 1. The sons of God appeared before God and the devil showed up. Okay, have you ever appeared in a place and you saw the devil to your side? Not in the spirit, to your side. Just like, hey, devil, you showed up. All right, because the devil is a spirit. So you're not going to see him. So if he appeared alongside the sons of God while they were having a meeting with God, it certainly means that the sons of God there is not referring to man. It's referring to angels. All right, when the angels were having a meeting with God in Job chapter 1, the devil showed up. He showed up. Why? Because the devil still has access to heaven. It cannot be his permanent place. But what does he do in heaven? When he goes, accuser of the brethren. Remember we read last week in Revelations after the, the vision of the woman and the dragon. And when the devil, the dragon is cast down for the final time. And I read and said, the Bible says Ange heaven celebrated because the, the old accuser of the saint has finally been cast down. He's been cast down before, but now he's now no longer given access to be able to accuse you before God. There will come a point for that. He can't live in heaven, but what he can still do is try to accuse you before God. Now, when you've got the blood of Jesus over you, you've got a greater intercessor. Peter says he's the what? The advocate. Our advocate with the Father. Because the devil is accusing, God's like, Jesus is like, no. My blood is over her. My blood is over him. You've got no right here. The devil is an accuser. The word Satan means accuser. Accuser of the, the brethren. There you go. All right. So we see that in, in Job chapter 1 verse 6. All right. Let's, but in Job, let's go to Job chapter 38 verse, verse 7. That's one some of you might have not seen before. Um, and this word, is, that word is used again. Job 38 verse 7. All right. We kind of read this last week. But this is God questioning Job and, and talking about his omnipotence to Job. Um, to give you context. So you say, okay, what are you reading from? Let's, let's just read from verse 4. I'll read really fast. Where were you? This is God speaking to Job. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. All right, God is giving him like a little rhetorical jab there. Surely you know, right? Well, he doesn't know. Um, or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Okay. All the sons of God shouted for joy when the stars sang together. God is asking Job, where were you? He wasn't there. No man was there. So he's clearly talking about angelic beings, not normal human beings. Because he says, the sons of God shouted for joy while the stars sang together. Were you there? No, you were not. Because that was in the pre-Adamite world. All right. So there you go. Sons of God. There, it's not clearly, he's clearly not talking about normal human beings. It's talking about angels. All right. Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Daniel 3, verse 25. It seems like I'm just getting to my, my Bible text faster tonight. My hands are on fire. All right. Verse 25. Look, he answered, I see four men loose. Walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the... Okay. Now, of course, that's talking about who? Jesus Christ. How did he see that? And no, it was like the Son of God. Because he's like, these are not normal human beings. These are not normal men. This guy is different. Son of God. This guy is unique. He has 
spirit qualities that normal, a normal man will not have. So you see that word, that line, son of God, sons of God, sons of God, just being clearly not referring to a regular human being. Because if it was a regular man, he would have said son of man there. But it was not a regular man. This guy was different. And of course, that was the pre-incarnate Christ in the Old Testament. All right. So we're seeing that these guys are not sons of God. Now, I did a little more digging, and in my more digging, in the Septuagint, in the Greek version of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and in the Mophat, it's another version of the Old Testament, it actually doesn't read sons of God. It just reads angels of God in there, just angels of God in there, okay? That harmonizes with my constant thought that these guys, we're not talking about regular people, we're talking about angelic beings here. Now, how many of you know who is who Josephus is? Josephus. How many of you know who Josephus is? J O S E P H, Joseph E S U S. How many know? Okay, a few people do. All right, give you a little bit of history. So Josephus has one of the most trusted extra biblical writings that argues for the existence of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'm not going to go deep into history. Um, he has a writing. I have his book over there, and I've read a little bit of it here and there. And um, if an atheist unbeliever was to ask you, show me extra biblical, so not from the Bible, show me extra biblical evidences that there was a man called Jesus in the earth. There's about nine, okay? Um, the writings of Tacitus. Um, and a few other Roman governors. But one of the most reliable and widely used by Christians to, to defend in that point is the writings of a guy called Josephus. Who was Josephus? Josephus was a Jewish historian. He lived within the worlds of Jerusalem. Um, and the Romans under um, Vespasian was emperor, AD 70 this was. Um, so this is about, you know, 1,930 years ago or so. Um, the Romans... I call it the great siege of Jerusalem in AD 70, where the Romans burned down the worlds of Jerusalem, right? Jesus prophesied about that in Matthew chapter 24 and 27. They have a siege over Jerusalem for two years. Vespasian's son, Titus, was the general leading the charge. Vespasian was the emperor. He started the siege, but gave it over to his son because he had to become emperor over Rome. And Josephus is a scholar. He's a Jewish scholar. Now, he doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. He's not a Christian, all right? We know this because he states this over and over again. Um, but at some point, while the Romans are starving out the Jews in the siege of Jerusalem, Josephus switches sides. He basically, he's a smart guy. He switches sides. And basically, when he switches sides, he writes the history of what happens in the siege of Jerusalem, but then goes further later on because he actually becomes a scribe of the emperor of Vespasian and of Titus because Titus took him in. Um, and he basically writes the most profound extra biblical evidences of Jesus, the existence of Jesus that's not found in scripture. So he is loved by biblical scholars and loved by me. I love his works. Josephus writes this about angels. He says, many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence that they had in their own strength. These men did what, re did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians, the Greeks, call giants. He writes in his book of the Antiquities. And again, he says, there will till then left, they left the ra a race of giants who had bodies so large and countenances so entirely different from other men that they were surprising to the sight and terrible to the hearing. The bones of these men are still shown to this very day. So in Jesus' times, the Jews could find the bones of giants who had lived on the earth. All right. Number four reason I give is church fathers wrote about this. The Antinicene fathers, you could call them, also refer to angels fallen into impure love of virgins, and they were subjugated by the flesh. Of these lovers of virgins, therefore, were begotten those who called them giants. 
Another church father, Justin Madarai, says, But the angels transgressed, were captivated by love of women, and begat children. Methodius says, The devil was insolent also, those angels who were enamored of fleshly charms, and had illicit intercourse with the daughters of man. With the daughters of man. Okay. However, I'm going to give you the best evidence of them all. The biblical evidence. Let's go to Jude. We'll do Jude and we'll do 2 Peter. And we'll be done for tonight. I didn't even go as far as I thought I would. I guess that's a common story these days. Jude, the book before Revelation. Jude has only one chapter. So you could just say one verse or just say verse. All right. Now Jude... It's a short book. It's got only 25 verses. That's it. But he gives us so powerful prophetic words, powerful prophetic words about the fights in the spirit realm. Now, next week, we will talk about the fight he talks about in verse 9 to verse 11 between, um, between um, the devil and angel Gabriel over the body of Moses. All right? So that's why when you talk about spiritual warfare, we're talking about actual, like, Okay, I know that sometimes when, because we've read Ephesians chapter 6 and other scriptures, you know, put on the whole armor of God, we think, okay, it's spiritual warfare, so it's not necessarily a warfare. No, it is warfare. I mean, there are angelic and demonic beings literally fighting that you cannot see. What? They're probably actually not. Well, I told you a few weeks ago that God assigns angels to churches, right? We see that from the seven churches of Revelation in Sardis and, uh, you know, Laodicea. I mean, all these churches they had angels God assigned to them. So we know God assigns angels to churches. We know God assigns angels to walk to and fro from the earth. We talked about this a few weeks ago, right? So they're fighting. So when you're like, when you pray, what you do is you actually, almost like you recharge the batteries of angels, to fight on your behalf. So that's why your prayer is important. That's why God will wake you up sometimes to intercede for somebody. Why? Because he knows when you pray, you are given angels strength to fight on your behalf. So prayer is powerful. Because when you pray in the spirit realm, the angels are energized to fight for you. Angels have limits to their powers. The devil has powers too. So the devil can actually wrestle with God's angels. We see so many examples in the Bible of God, of, of, of God's angel wrestling with the devil. In Daniel, right? Right? In Jude, between the devil over Moses' body. Moses' body. This is a servant of God. And the devil was wrestling over Moses' body with angel Michael. Oh boy. So, yeah, the devil actually engages in, like, real warfare. It, we call it spiritual warfare because you cannot see the warfare with your eyes. But it's actual warfare going on. All right. But let's read this. Jude chapter 1. Let me get my scripture. Give me one second. I forgot my verse. It's in there somewhere. Give me a second. Where it was. Verse 6. There we go. That's it. Thank you, Janice, my Bible scholar. <laughs> All right. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain. Now watch this. But left their own abode. He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. I told you, in a, maybe not next week, but now in two weeks, I'll talk about the five levels of the underworld and the different places God chains the devil and the demons and stuff. But think about this. Okay. Now you say, well, isn't that, isn't that the account of the fallen angels when the devil fell with his angels? No. Watch this. We'll read it again. There's a big difference. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but did what? But left. They were not kicked out in the original account when the devil, the devil did not leave heaven and come down to earth on his own. 
his angels that rebelled alongside with him did not leave heaven of their own will and come down to earth. They were kicked out by Angel Michael and the other angels. Here it says they left their abode. Why? Because of Genesis chapter 6. They saw the beautiful daughters of men. And here it says they left their abode. They did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode. And what has God done? He has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great. God bound up these demons that left their abode that came to basically carry out evil spiritual intercourse with man. Second Peter chapter 2, last scripture before we go tonight. Just trying to land on a certain spot before we do. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 4 to 5. For if God did not spare the angels who did what? Who sinned. But cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. Threw them out. Why? Because they sinned. Now watch this. It didn't say the devil there. It says the angels sinned. What sin? Fornication. Le leaving, we saw it in Jude. Leaving their own abode and seeking to sleep with the daughters of men and in so doing producing giants. All right, we'll talk about the Nephilim. We'll talk about the sons of Anak. It's seen in Joshua. It's seen in Numbers. It's seen all through the Bible in Deuteronomy. Giants. Giants. These are not God's design. <laughs> not God's design. These are demonic, demonic things happening when people decide to defy God's law. As we close tonight. What is one of the biggest ways that America and people around the world are seeking to defy God's divine order? It's written about in Romans chapter 1, in Peter, in Jude. Homosexuality. Transgenderism. It's, the Bible calls it strange flesh. They sought strange flesh. So, human beings are doing what the angels did. They are defying God's divine order. Now, do you now see the connection between the devil in all these things? He used angels that were built to serve God's purposes, but he's also now using people to do why because at every point and at every turn he's seeking to defy God's order what's God's order for God made man and he made woman full stop no 52 genders that's a bunch of nonsense he made man and woman he didn't make a third gender or fourth gender or fifth or 256, like they say, I don't care what you say or think you are. I went into the post office today. The guy is standing next to me, dressed like whatever he was dressed like, transvestite, whatever. Had, of course, a shaved face. So I was like, dude, my gosh. Wearing a very skinny jean and making a whole woman bun, whatever. I was like, dude. It's in my head, of course. <laughs> Stop the confusion. God made man, God made woman. That has been the truth for thousands of years. Ah, 21st century, man decides, ah, oh, we're going to start making this different. You're not going to change it. You are not. You can do, do all the surgeries you want, cut off all the organs that make whatever you are, whatever you are, be on drugs for the rest of your life. If you were born a man, you will be a man. And if you were born a woman, you will die a woman. It doesn't matter how you mask it. For God made man and God made woman. And he made them to only have relations with each other. Not one with the same sex. It is a defiance of God's 
law, God's will, God's ways, God's behavior, God's reputation. The Bible says it's an abomination. It's against creation, and it is. I'm not a hate preacher. I'm just speaking facts. If you hate it, up to you. We'll see in 100 years from now where you end up. There is a reason why. There is a reason why HIV AIDS is a thing in that community. And will always be. You cannot defy God's laws and ways. And what was the virus that came out just a few months ago that was running rampant before they tried to find a vaccine? It's not going to stop. You, every year you're going to see a new virus. They're going to try to find a vaccine for it. A new one will come. Because if you try to upset God's order, all you're going to have is issues. That's it. That's all you're going to have. Look at what's happening. Think about this. 25 years ago, statistics showed that the people who died out of gender dysphoria and confusion were in their tens. Guess how many people commit suicide right now due to gender dysphoria? They're in their thousands. What changed? Did you change? Brother David, you've been around a long time. Did you change? No, you didn't. Nothing changed. The world is the same world. But we have a crisis, not because people have always been gender fluid. We have a crisis because man has said to himself, I'm going to alter God's divine plan and God's divine order. And now I'm going to make all these children crazy and not sure of the body. Did you ever hear somebody 15 to 20 years ago say, I was not sure of the body I was born in? Nobody ever said that. Did you ever hear that 20 years ago? And now every kid seems to say it. Isn't it obvious that this is a whole mechanization of, a, is it, isn't it obvious that this is a demonic agenda? God wiped out the giant who we read about. And he's going to wipe out whatever form of defiance man brings against him. You could be that. I love you. I'm not going to tell you you're going to hell. I mean, if you rebel, you will. But I won't condemn you. Your own words will condemn you. Because when you stand before God in heaven and he asks you, you'll give account. But the truth is the truth. Let's pray.